Hello and welcome back to Real Analysis. And of course, as always, first I want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. Now as promised, today in part 56 we will prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. And please recall, we had two parts of this theorem and indeed we will prove both of them. Now, in order to do this, we will need the so-called mean value theorem of integration. Of course, you know we have a mean value theorem for differentiation and this is a related theorem now for the integral. So then let's immediately formulate it. We have two functions f and g and both should be defined on the interval a, b. Moreover, as often, we need continuous functions here. And in addition, the function g should be a non-negative function. So no matter which point from the interval we put into the function g, we always get a value out that is positive or zero. Okay, and then the claim of the theorem is that we find an intermediate point x hat. And of course, this one should fulfill something for the integral of f times g. Hence, we write integral from a to b of f of x times g of x. And now this integral can be written as f of x hat times the non-negative number given by the integral of g. So you see, the claim here is that we can pull the function f out of the integral. We just need to find a suitable point x hat of the interval. So you see, this here represents a mean value. However, often you see a more special version of this theorem. Indeed, we also only need this special version and it's better to visualize. And we get this version when we eliminate g in the theorem, which means we set it to the constant 1. Then you see, on the left hand side, we just have the integral of the function f. And moreover, on the right hand side, we don't need an integral anymore. We just have the integral of the constant, which means we have b minus a. In fact, I think this is a very nice formulation of the theorem you can easily remember. Moreover, the visualization helps a lot here. So maybe just imagine this is the graph of the function f. Hence, the area here in blue is the value we have on the left hand side. And the right hand side is represented by a rectangle, where the width of the rectangle is given by b minus a here and the height by f of x hat. It simply means we find a rectangle with the same area as the integral. And of course the claim of the theorem is that we find such an x hat, which means we find an intersection point of this line here with the graph of the function. Hence you can just remember the mean value theorem of integration tells you that an integral can be transformed into a rectangle. However, sadly the visualization for the general formulation of the theorem is not so easy. On the other hand, proving this general formulation is as hard as proving the special one. Hence we can just prove the whole theorem even if we just need the special version. Therefore let's immediately start and in the first step we just need the graph of the function f again. Now you know, since f is a continuous function defined on the closed interval, it has a minimum and a maximum. Therefore, let's call the maximal value we find capital M and the minimal value lowercase m. Hence, in a formula, this means that we have two numbers that fulfill inequalities. And of course, this holds for all numbers x in the interval a, b. However, now in the theorem, we are interested in the product f times g. Therefore, the idea would be to multiply the inequalities with g of x. This does not change the inequalities because g of x is always positive or zero. So g is greater or equal than zero implies m times g of x is less or equal than f of x times g of x. And this is then less or equal than capital M times g of x. Okay, and then you see, the only thing that remains is now the integral sign. And indeed, we can just add the integral signs and the inequalities remain 
because the integral is monotonic. Therefore, you see we get a very nice result where the integral of the product is in the middle. And in addition, on the left hand side and the right hand side, we have the integral of g together with a factor. And if the factor is lowercase m, the result is less or equal than this integral. And if the factor is capital M, it's greater or equal. Therefore, we can choose a factor in between such that we have equality. And let's call this factor mu. More precisely, for this factor mu, we have mu times this integral is equal to this integral here. And now because this factor mu lies between the minimum and the maximum of the function f, we can apply the intermediate value theorem. And please note, we can apply this because the function f is continuous. And please recall, the intermediate value theorem gives us such an x hat. Hence, f of x hat is exactly this value mu. And then you should see, with this equality here, the theorem is proven. Therefore, in summary, you see continuity of the function f was crucial here. Okay, then with this, our first proof is finished. And then we can go back to the first fundamental theorem of calculus. In fact, this proof here will be very quick now. However, maybe first recall the claim of the first fundamental theorem of calculus. It tells us that for a continuous function f, this function here is an antiderivative. Therefore, we have to show that capital F is differentiable and that the derivative is lowercase f. Hence, for a small number h, we have to calculate f of x plus h minus f of x. Then in the end, we can divide this by h and send h to zero. And if this limit exists, f would be differentiable at the point x. However, maybe let's first visualize what we have here. Here please recall, if this is the graph of the function lowercase f, then the area here is the value of the function capital F of x. And then if we go to the point x plus h in this picture, we would have a larger area. Hence, the small area we see here is exactly the difference we have here on the left. Or in other words, this is the integral where we start with x and end with x plus h. And now for this integral, or for this area, we can apply the mean value theorem from above. In other words, this area here can be exactly calculated with a suitable rectangle. And we know the height is given by some point x hat. And of course, from above we know the point x hat has to lie in this small interval here. And moreover, you also see the width of the rectangle is just h. In fact, this is very nice because you remember we want to divide this difference here by the factor h. Hence, this difference quotient here is just f of x hat. So, in the limit h to 0, we just have to look what happens with f of x hat. And there you should see, if h gets smaller and smaller, we don't have so many choices for x hat in the end. And of course, since f is a continuous function, we get f of x in the limit. So in conclusion, the derivative of capital F exists. And moreover, we know f prime is equal to lowercase f. So you see, this is exactly what we wanted to show. Capital F is an antiderivative of lowercase f. So the first fundamental theorem of calculus is proven, such an integral always gives an antiderivative. Therefore, let's close this one and let's go to the second fundamental theorem of calculus. There, please recall, it tells us that an integral can always be calculated with an antiderivative. More concretely, the integral of f from a to b can be calculated by f of b minus f of a, where this capital F here can be any antiderivative of lowercase f. However, in the proof here, we first start with one special antiderivative. Namely, we take the one we had before. 
However, to distinguish it from the other ones, let's call it F0. Here, please recall, by the first fundamental theorem of calculus, we know that this is an antiderivative of lowercase f. And moreover, we also know the value of the function at the point a. Namely, it's just 0. Simply because this would be the integral from a to a. However, this means that this formula here is clearly fulfilled for f0. Therefore, the first step of the proof is already finished. Now, the second step should show that for another antiderivative, this formula still holds. Therefore, let's choose an arbitrary antiderivative capital F. And here we can recall the last video where we have discussed how an arbitrary antiderivative of f has to look like. Indeed, we have learned that two antiderivatives just differ by an additive constant we can call c. Hence, f can be written as f0 plus c. And with this, you see, we can simplify the term f of b minus f of a. In fact, in this difference here, the term c will just vanish. Therefore, instead of f, we can write f0. However, for f0, we have already shown that the formula holds. And so, in summary, we get this formula here for any antiderivative of f. Therefore, finally, this proves the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, then I would say we were very successful with all the proofs today. And we can continue in the next videos by proving some important integration rules. For example, we will start with the integration by substitution. Therefore, I really hope that I see you there. Have a nice day and bye. Thank you.